good bunch of folks here. The quality of the people is really good. <laughs> Amen. All right. And I tell you, Brother Bill and Shirley look like patriots. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, I look like a car dealer. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. Listen, if you got your Bible with you, I hope you have. We're going to look at Galatians. And last Sunday night, we talked about marks of Christian maturity. From Colossians chapter 2, we really covered the first four verses of chapter 2. I read eight verses. Now, I'm going to read the eight again tonight. And I'm reading it in the King James Version. And I trust that you've got something that will follow closely anyway. I've been reading the NIV, and I don't know why I picked up the wrong Bible when I came in. So I'm just going to read what I got. Uh, Colossians chapter 2, verse 1. For I would that you knew what great conflict I have for you, and for them at Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. You know, Paul had never met these people face to face, and so he's writing them, and he has a very fatherly tone to this great deal of love expressed in what he said. Verse 2, that their hearts may be comforted being knit together in love and unto all the riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. Somebody's going to come along, they're going to try to trick you, they're going to try to lead you astray. And Paul said, I'm saying this so you'll be on guard for somebody that's trying to lead you astray. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in the spirit. Joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. Paul was so thrilled that these people were anchored in the Lord. They weren't being blown about. Verse 6, as you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. You trusted Jesus by faith. Now keep on trusting and keep on walking. Obedience to the Lord he's talking about. Rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. There's going to be people come along that are going to try to lead you astray. Maybe you've run into some of that. Last week we talked about the first thing Faith in difficult times. There are some days that come that it's very difficult to hold on to your faith. He talks about being loving in our relationship. You can't be a Christian, folks, and not have love in your heart. And the third thing we talked about last week was growing in knowledge and understanding. Nobody ought to just be anchored there and not move. 
You remember that song, I Shall Not Be Moved? And there's a lot of people that are not moving very much in the Lord. And then having discernment in confusing times. We need some discernment. You know, there are a lot of things that we say when we're angry. We say hurtful things when we're angry. We say inappropriate things when we're angry. And uh, we, we act like we're childish when we're angry. You know, a little kid get mad at his little friend and say, I hate you. You know, he thinks he's really doing something big when he does that. <coughs> you know, a frequent comment that you hear people when they shoot off their mouth about something is, why don't you grow up? And uh, the Apostle Paul talks about that over in 1 Corinthians, that we should not be childish in our understanding. Now, it is a shame. Some way or another, we figure as you get older, and most of us sitting here tonight, we're old enough that we ought to have some degree of maturity. That is, we are not just ruled over by our emotions and by our selfish desires. And uh, you begin to act more appropriately as you get older. Well, sometimes you do. <laughs> Have you ever seen people that they got the attitude, maybe they're 80, 90 years old, and they say, man, I've lived long enough, I'd say anything I want to. Let me tell you, you never get to the place that you ought to just shoot off your mouth and say anything you want to. If you're a Christian, you need to be sure to temper your words with grace, to be loving. <coughs> you know, uh, when you have been a believer for a few years, then it is expected that you will advance in the grace of the Lord. You know, I, I never forget. My dad was 50 years old and more when he gave his heart to Jesus. And man, he had been a cusser, I mean, Oh, filthy, profane, dirty words just fall out of his mouth. And he hadn't been saved two weeks. And he lost the great part of his vocabulary and you'd never hear him using those old filthy words anymore. Listen. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. You've got a dirty mouth, you've got a dirty heart. And we need to realize that God changes some of these things for us. When we come to know Jesus, it is expected that there will be a new depth of faith and a new vitality in our life. And we, if we act with immaturity, it will diminish our testimony for the Lord. Now God will use the old and God will use the new and God will use the mended and God may even use the broken, but God won't use a dirty vessel, folks. And God won't use us. We look at the qualities that make us a mature believer. And I want you to pay attention verse number 5, 6, and 7 tonight. 
And I want to say that these are some marks of maturity. First, in verse 5, Paul writes and said, For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit, and delight to see how orderly you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. These people were really making progress. They were firm in the Lord. And he was proud of them. He see, you see the affection that he has for them. He wants them to know that although I am not there and haven't been there and you had not met me face to face, that my heart is with you. I love you in the Lord. And he was delighted at how orderly they were in their relationship with each other and with the Lord. Now, what he uses here are some military terms. Though I am absent with you in the flesh, I am with you in the spirit, loving, beholding your service and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. He is using these terms and you're picturing in these verses a disciplined military unit. It's like here's a big bunch of soldiers and they're in ranks in, in ranks out on the parade field and they're marching in formation and the message is very clear that this group has been disciplined and that they are cooperating one another with one another. The battle group is organized and everybody does their job and they remain solid in the face of opposition. There is careful, rigorous, and constant training. If these guys are going to march, they keep their line straight, they march in step, they use a measured stride, and it's almost just beautiful to watch a group of men that have been trained and taught and they march like this, and Paul sees the Colossians like this, they have arrived at a measure of maturity in the Lord, and he sees them all working together in discipline and in love. Sometimes it's helpful to understand the concept of stating things in opposites. You know, the opposite of being orderly and firm in your faith would be haphazard, undependable, impulsive, and flabby. Have you ever seen a group of Christian people and if you were to describe their walk with the Lord, you'd say, well, they're pretty flabby in their relationship with the Lord. What do you mean? Well, they're pretty soft. They're not together. They're, they're haphazard. Now, which term describes your walk with the Lord? Are you haphazard and undependable? Impulsive and flabby? Or are you orderly and firm? And in obedience to the Lord. You know, the best illustration I can think of is exercise. And you say, well, preacher, you sure need to know something about exercise. You know, I couldn't agree more with you. But uh, I find uh, if you want to be in your best physical condition, then you want to be firm and not flabby. <laughs> Boy, that takes a lot of nerve to say that, don't it? <laughs> And uh, you, you, you know what, if you are not flabby, if you're firm in your physical body, it means that 
you are disciplined, regular exercise, eating right, and practicing good habits will help you be better toned physically and make you feel better. You know, I have been known to have back problems and you know when your back gets out of whack and you can't hardly walk, you walk like a crab and it hurts all the way down the back of your leg, all the way down to your heel. Remember the last time it got to doing that, I went over there and that Dr. Miller gave me two shots right in the middle of my spine and I, he said this is going to relieve the pain and it may last for two days and it may last for, for two months and it may last for two years and you may never be bothered again. Well, praise the Lord. I took the shots and I had never been bothered anymore. Well, praise the Lord for that. But, you know, when you begin to hurt again, that's when you know, hey, I need to trim some off of the bread basket here. And uh, I'll tell you what you can do. You can get out on the floor and do sit-ups. Do about a hundred sit-ups every day and watch your diet and get up and go walk three miles and you'll get to feeling better in about two months. But if you get to going back and sitting around on your bow hump and eating poorly and not getting any exercise, you'll get flabby again just like that. That's why people are flabby. Because they don't take care. You say, well, preacher, who are you to talk about? I'm putting myself right there with you. Do you see, this is similar to our spiritual walk, folks. You may be very intense for a period of time between you and the Lord, and the Holy Spirit is guiding you, and you feel a sense of God's presence in your life. But then what happens? you begin to coast a little. And you don't put forth the effort and you don't spend time in prayer and you don't wait on the presence of the Lord. And what happens? You become flabby spiritually. You get so you don't have any power with God and you don't even desire to pray. The mature believer avoids coasting. That's lack of self-discipline. There's absolutely no way for you to walk with the Lord without discipline in your life. Now there are some things you can do to have a disciplined faith. And I'm going to mention four or five things here. And it's not that I think I've got a corner on the market, but these are just common sense things that you know. One is you can read a book. And the best book to read is the Bible. It's not the only book to read, but it's the best book to read. Listen, folks, the Bible is God talking to us. How else can you say it? It is rude to ignore someone when they're talking. Here's somebody standing up saying something to you and you're not paying one ounce of attention to them. That's rude. It is equally rude and foolish for us to ignore God's communication to us. <coughs> Who has time for a Bible reading? Is that what you say? We all have time. We just have to give time to it. Read the Bible instead of magazines when you go to the doctor's office. Keep a Bible in your car and you get stuck in a traffic jam or you're sitting somewhere waiting on somebody in, that's in, in a building somewhere, you can sit there and read your Bible. You can get up 15 minutes earlier in the morning time and have a quiet time, just you and the Lord. 
you can get involved in a Bible study group. <coughs> There's a lot of people that have Bible study groups, and that is invaluable to us as Christians. The key is don't just read the book. Meditate on it. Think about it. Ponder it in your heart and in your mind. Ask God, what are you saying? What do you want me to learn on this, God? He's got something in mind. <clears throat> now, the next thing, read a book. Here's the next one. Talk to the author. You know, we need to visit more with God, folks. We really do. We are so formal in our prayer life, you know. We have a list of things that we want to talk to God about. And so often we go down the list and we get through the list all right. But what becomes the focus of our prayer is the things that we've got written down there. And what I'm saying to us is we need to focus on sharing God's person as God speaks to us. <coughs> be respectable unto the Lord. Let him be your best friend. Who is your best friend? Is it Jesus? We say that. Listen, here's another thing you can do. Read a book, talk to the author. Third thing is make time for quiet time. Make time. We're so active, we seldom get a chance to just stop in the quietness and listen to God and what He's trying to say to us. Listen, God's Word says it. Be still and know that I'm God. What a wonderful thing it is. And then, let me say, here's another thing you want to draw near to the Lord. Serve. Serve. Look for opportunities where you can give yourself and help and service to other people. It may be that you do it at a shelter, at a hospital, or in the church building. It may be with the everyday task of life. Look for ways that you can practice being a servant. You know what you one thing you can do? I never seek to be amazed. I get ready like I'm going to the hospital to visit. By the way, Jeannie Harless is in Northeast Methodist Hospital in room 369 and she, they think she's got pneumonia. Pray for Jeannie, would you? But you know, I, there's some things we can do. We open the door for people. I open the door for a little lady going in the Northeast Methodist, Northeast Baptist Hospital the other day, and she was so shocked. I guess she thought I was going to run ahead of her and slam the door on her. But she thanked me profusely just for opening the door. You know, we we need to. Remember that Jesus humbled himself and took upon him the form of a servant. Are you a servant? Are you? That's an honor to do it for the Lord. You see, there's so many things consistent with our daily living. I want you to look at verses 6 and 7. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus as Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and grounded, built up in him, established in the faith, and have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Here, he's talking about daily living. Number six, verse six is the most challenging verse in all of the Bible. The old Amplified Version says this, As you have therefore received Christ, even Jesus the Lord, so regulate your lives and conduct and conduct yourself in union and in conformity to His image. 
conform to the image of Jesus. I want to tell you, I don't think Jesus would be abrupt and sharp and critical of people. I think he'd be very patient and understanding, and I think that would be well if God's people could model themselves after that. <coughs> Notice the sequence that Paul writes here. He says, As you have therefore received the Lord Jesus, listen, things have to be done in a certain order. How do you start your walk with the Lord? You start by receiving Christ. And after you've received Christ, then you surrender your life to Him. And you follow Him as Lord. Listen, it's a package deal. Once you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, you also receive Him as Lord. That means he's the boss of your life. It's not just saying, well, I believe in Jesus. It's saying, yes, Lord, thy will be done. It literally means that we live by his example and we follow his command. If you love me, keep my commands. That's what Jesus said. We got no excuse for not doing what the Lord said except we're rude and ill-mannered and disobedient. Now, I'm not saying we're going to be perfect. Far from that. But isn't that the standard we're shooting for? Be ye perfect even as your heavenly Father is perfect. You don't have to be holy and self-righteous. You don't have to try to demonstrate that you're Mr. Goody Two-Shoes. You just have to walk humbly with the Lord. St. Francis, one day in the monastery, said to a young man who had just came into the monastery, I want you to go with me. We're going to go into town and we're going to preach. And the young man was thrilled to death that St. Francis had asked him to go into town and they were going to go on a preaching mission. So they got themselves ready and they left the monastery. And they went down the principal streets and they turned down many of the byways and down some of the alleys and they made their way out to the suburb in the little town where the monastery was located and at length they got through with all they were doing and they made their way back to the monastery gate. And when they came back in the gate of the monastery, the younger man remind, reminded St. Francis of their intention and said, Father, have you forgotten that we went downtown to preach? And St. Francis said to the young man, Son, we have preached. We were preaching while we were walking. We have been seen by men. And our behavior has been closely looked at. It was thus we preached. By living an example and walking with the Lord on our way. It is of no use, my son, to walk anywhere to preach unless you preach everywhere you walk. You know how we need to do that, folks. Now the third mark of maturity Paul mentions is in verse 7. He said, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Paul says there are two, two results. You give your heart to the Lord and you walk with Him. And you are rooted and built up. Now what does that mean? It means you are strengthened in the faith. When we walk with the Lord in our daily life, 
we become increasingly sure of the truth of God's Word and the power of the Holy Spirit. And we become acquainted with Him. Have you ever tested the Lord? God's Word says that we can do that, you know. Over in, in Malachi chapter 3, and when he talks about tithing, he said, Prove me herewith, saith the Lord, if I won't open you the window of heaven. He said, You can test me. We can test the Lord in our daily lives, and He will prove faithful to us. The result of this consistent walk with Christ will be an overwhelming sense of gratitude. As you mature in your relationship with Jesus, you're going to become sweeter to everybody that you meet. You're going to have a different attitude. You're going to have a, a be a blessing to somebody instead of just being there. You know, are you more grateful to the Lord right now than you've ever been in your life? I am. I want to tell you, I count the blessings that God has given to me and I realize that God, I could never repay the Lord for what He's done in my life in you. No. You see how awesome, how great God is. Now, you realize how deeply sin has infected your life. When we come to Christ, I want to tell you, we have little idea of how pervasive, how deeply sin has soaked into our lives and our hearts and our minds. And as we grow in the Lord, we see the stain of sin in our life and we realize that we can't begin to cleanse it ourselves. And we look at what God has done in our life and we just have to say, why me, Lord? God, why do you keep on blessing me? Did you ever say that to somebody? Why does God keep on blessing you? Because he loves you. You know, a mature Christian is not arrogant. They're not snooty. A mature believer is someone that is soft and mature and humble and grateful. One day, Back in the 4th century, there was a preacher named Taller, Brother Taller, T-A-U-L-E-R. Taller was a, an evangelist. He's going down the road, and he met a beggar. And he said to the beggar as he passed by, God give you a good day, my friend. And the beggar said back to him, I thank God I've never had a bad day. And Taller said to him, Then God has really given you a happy life, my friend. And the old beggar looked back at Taller and said, I thank God I've never been unhappy in my life that I can remember. And Taller said to the old beggar, He said in amazement, what do you mean you've never been unhappy in your life? And the beggar said, well, when everything is going good, I thank God for it. And when it rains, even if I'm getting wet, I thank God for it. And when I have plenty to eat and my belly is full, I thank God for it. And since it is, since God's will is what I want done in my life, that's my will, it pleases Him 
to bless me and it pleases me. And I should never be unhappy with God because He is controlling my life and blessing me. You ever think about that? You've got no right to be unhappy with God. God is the one who's sovereign, not me. And the beggar said to taller, I'm a child of the king, and I have no complaint. And Brother Taller said to the beggar, Where is your kingdom? And the beggar said back to him, It's in my heart right here. And Taller said, You are truly a mature believer in Christ. You know, when we realize the kingdom of God is in our hearts, folks, we have taken a step of maturity in the Lord. Can I conclude the message tonight by saying, how do you measure up with the Lord in maturity? Are you faithful in difficult times? Or are you blown about a little bit and become unconcerned? Do you have love in your relationship with people around you? Are you growing in your knowledge and understanding every day? Do you have discernment even in confusing times? Are you consistent in your daily walk with Christ? As you have received Christ, so walk ye in Him. Are you overflowing with gratitude? Is it easy to say, thank you, Lord? What do we say at the church? God is good all the time. All the time. He really is, folks. And I want you to know that this matter of maturing in the Lord doesn't depend on your IQ, it depends on your character. It's what you are on the inside. We're talking about what God is looking for in us. God is looking for us. Walk humbly with the Lord, my friend. That's what he's looking for. It is likely that God may point out some things in your life as he does mine. Maybe God convicts you of some areas in your life tonight. Maybe you don't pray as much as you ought to. Maybe you don't have a quiet time when you really just stop and wait on the Lord and meditate on his word. Maybe sometimes you fly off and you act childish. Paul said, when I was a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. That's what we need to do as God's children. It is possible. Maybe you're not growing spiritually. Maybe you didn't get a proper start. You know, before you can grow, you have to be born again. And there's a lot of people misunderstand being born again, and they think it's gaining some knowledge and having some head knowledge about what this book said. It's not in your mind, it's in your heart. That Jesus becomes the Lord and Master of your heart. How do you get the great gift of maturity in the Lord? I tell you, it all starts in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, when it says, if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we're saved. 
For with the heart man will, for with the heart, for with the mind man believes under salvation, and with the heart he, he gives himself to the Lord. You know, we need to recognize that we need forgiveness every day. We need it. That we must believe and acknowledge that Jesus Christ really died on a cross and was buried and was raised from the dead and he ever lives to make intercession for us. I want to tell you, the Lord is alive in your heart and mine right now. Maybe tonight you look at yourself as I do. Maturity in the Lord. Wouldn't it be wonderful if all of God's children could come to the maturity of the faith of the Lord Jesus. There could be some unity in the church. When we have revival, we wouldn't have four services and not have anybody walk the aisle, but our hearts would be so burdened and God God could bring salvation to lost souls. That's something we need to pray in our church. That God will make us to be an evangelistic church that reaches out to people who don't know Jesus. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you tonight for your love for your grace. Father, how I pray that you might touch all of our lives. Help us, Heavenly Father, that we'll come to the unity of the Spirit and that, God, you can use our church as an instrument of bringing people to a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. God help us tonight. I pray that you'll put burdens on the hearts of each one, mine and each one of these people, that we will have a definite person on our mind that needs to know Christ and that we'll pray that you can bring it to pass. God, I just pray tonight that you'll have your own way in my heart and in the hearts of each person. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to have a short invitation tonight. And we're going to sing.